Hello, welcome to Secure Talk, your trusted source of information on the latest threats, trends, tools, and technology related to cybersecurity and compliance. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Secure Talk. My name is Mark Schreiner, and I'll be your host for this episode of Secure Talk. Today, we're going to be talking with Carl Matson, who is the CISO, the Chief Information Security Officer at No Name Security. Uh, Carl has a very interesting background. I believe he's a graduate of the FBI CISO Academy. We're going to talk a little bit about that. He's also a CISSP, which is probably the highest credential you can get in this space. So he's got a, a, a lot of um, uh, you know, experience. And we're going to be talking with Carl a little bit about what No Name Security does, and then primarily about API securities, excuse me, API security, and why it's important, why it should be prioritized. But before we do that, let's uh, let's say hi to Carl. Carl, how are you today? I'm doing well, thanks, Mark. That's awesome. Hey, I like I, people can't see it because we're not going to show the the video, but I do like your uh, your your microphone there. Is that how how have you mounted that? Uh, it, it's a it's a Yeti Blue uh, mounted on an arm. So it comes down looking like I'm on the Howard Stern show or something, but it's really just a $90 microphone. Well, it looks impressive. I actually have the Yeti Blue too. Um, I've been using okay. it for about four years and take it with me on my travels and so on and so forth. It's been a great microphone, but I don't have that kind of setup that you'd have there. So very cool. And um, wh where are you based at, Carl? Uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. And how are things in Minneapolis right now? Uh, perfect. Uh, for six months a year, uh, Minneapolis is about the best city in the U.S. to live in. It's the other six months that uh, chase everybody to the <laughs> south for the winter. It's so funny because I'm from, I'm from Seattle, and Seattle, I, I wouldn't even say six months. I would say about three months. It's heaven on earth um, in the summertime, and then we get these long, dark, cold winters. Um, I'm, I'm actually down in Arizona right now looking at a blue sky, and I'm just, just loving it because we don't get it there. Hey, uh, just totally another off-topic thing. I just read a book that was set in Minneapolis. It was called The Book Haters Club. Have you heard of that? I haven't. Probably not. I need to put okay. it on my list. <laughs> it's funny because the lady who wrote it, um, she in her book, the, the Book Haters Club, she references all these great writers and books that come from Minneapolis, and it's uh, it's quite the, the cultural kind of um, center for the Midwest, I would think. Uh, I, I the, have you heard of the writer Chuck Klosterman? Um, I have. Run for I don't Vanity think... Fair, ESPN. Um, he, he and I both grew up uh, roughly the same town in uh, rural North Dakota uh, back in the wow. 1980s. So I, I, I have a, 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 a bookshelf full of Chuck Klosterman novels and, and essays uh, that he's sort of my uh, my go-to writer from up here. I, I... I'm taking a note here. I'll check it out. And of course, I, we, we are going to talk about cybersecurity in a second here. But uh, but of course, when you bring up North Dakota in the 1980s, um, you had to be a fan of Fargo or a hater. I don't know which. <laughs> um, Remember the movie Fargo? <laughs> yeah. Yes, but it it, it doesn't uh, it doesn't look look or feel familiar. Uh, so okay. it, I, I enjoy it as the as the work of fiction that it is. But it, it is not in any way sort of reminiscent of home. Oh, well, see, and me never even having spent really much time in North Dakota. I think I drove through one time. I would thought that that's just how people were. But um, OK, <laughs> the Cone brothers got it wrong. They they exercised a little artistic license, I guess. Well, you'll 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 pick up at some point during this podcast. They probably got the accent right. And that's, the, okay. uh, <laughs> uh, you know, that's that's the hard thing to do. All right. Well, hey, um, Carl, maybe um, first off, uh, we can set the stage. Tell us a little bit about uh, what No Name Security does. By the way, I love the name. Um, one of, sure. we're re you know, referencing movies and books. One of my favorite westerns of, of all time was uh, My Name Is Nobody, and uh, Who Me? Oh, I'm nobody. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever seen it. It was uh, Henry Fonda and uh, Terrence. I can't remember his last name, but uh, great, great thing. But what's what does No Name Security do? Well, No Name Security uh, is an API security company. So we work with organizations uh, to secure uh, APIs uh, from the from the moment the developers begin coding them all the way through their uh, production lifecycle and uh, and including the the uh, 2 a.m. Saturday morning alerts that go off in the SOC team that there's a there's an attack in progress. So a APIs are 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 all that we think about all day, and that's what we that's what we do. Okay, well, and, and I read somewhere, and I think it was in the notes to prepare for this um, this talk, that the average enterprise has something like fifteen thousand APIs. Is that is that true? Y yes. So that was uh, research that we commissioned, and and that's for organizations of ten thousand employees or more. So um, every organization is different, but there's sort of a, a heuristic that we see 
generally playing out, which is that uh, APIs in an organization almost always outnumber the number of employees. That's crazy, um, and I had no idea. I because from where I sit in like the organization that I that I work with, um, we we sell software as a service, and mm. you know we might. Uh, when we when we have a new customer, we might uh, you know send one or two API signals in or out, right? And and yep. and in my limited the context that I'm looking at, I was like, wow, so maybe total they've got like 20. How do the how does a company have a company of 10,000 or more employees? How do they end up with 15,000 different APIs? Sure. So we could look at that that answer in sort of two two distinctly different populations. The first is uh, that that one API that that is exposed via the mobile app. So let's just say for the sake of discussion, the API that checks your bank balance uh, on your mobile application for your bank. Um, that API really just starts a chain reaction of API calls because then there's a sequence of, of for, for example, authentication or policy enforcement um, the calls to a database. So that one API actually uh, results in the the triggering of, of oftentimes dozens of APIs internal to the to the organization. So um, the, so the public facing APIs are just the small tip of the iceberg uh, that serve like serve the the application's purpose, and then the second surface, which is sort of easy to easier to forget about, is what we'd call the the management plane uh, of an organization. So let's say that that mobile application is hosted in Azure or AWS. Um, uh, Azure and AWS, most of the workloads um, in our public cloud services uh, are managed via API. So let's say for the sake of discussion, it's got things like Security Hub and CloudTrail uh, and um, uh, GitHub, uh, we're pushing code through Jenkins, we're logging in through Okta or AWS or Azure AD, all of those services that are actually managing and supporting that application, they're all API-based services. So if you look at like a typical mobile application, let's just say banking or telemedicine, um, you've got a small handful of APIs that the customer interfaces with like directly, um, but underneath the surface, there's a there's a, um, a tremendous amount of uh, or quantity of APIs that, uh, that both serve the application and then operate the factory of the application behind the scenes. Okay, that makes a lot of sense, and um, I'm getting starting to get a little scared here. Uh, <laughs> so let me let me ask you, um, what are the primary security issues or risks that go along with you know having such a large number of APIs? Sure. So it, we we typically look to the OWASP, which is the o Open Web Application Security Project. It's an open source project that's been around for over a decade, uh, and and OWASP publishes what's called an API Top Ten Risks. And universally speaking, I think anybody who looks at API security probably agrees that for the most part, uh, the OWASP Top Ten is spot on. It does represent the ten. We call it the top 10 things that can go wrong with an API. Now, there's a lot more than 10, and we we look at it as more of about 150, but um, but the the risks of APIs are really three part. Uh, the, the first is is the um, is the is the design of the source code and and is is it designed securely? So let's say for the sake of discussion, I publish an API that looks up bank account information, but I don't design in uh, authentication or requirement as as part of that design. Um, that's clearly a, a coding flaw. So um, um, that would be the, the first category, which is a, a poorly designed API. Uh, the second category would be configuration. So let's say the developer uh, of a banking application, a mobile banking API, um, designs authentication, um, but at the at the uh, network layer, that authentication is not enforced, um, and that enforcement usually takes place uh, like at an API gateway or an a API management plane. So um, IBM's research actually uh, indicates that um, the majority of API breaches are not of the design of the API; they're in the configuration of it. And what that really means is is how it operates operates in the world versus how it was designed originally. Um, and then the third category, we call like the management of the API. So do we audit it? Do we log it? Do we detect anomalies? And so those those management activities, they really fall into the security team's prerogative because if the developers are doing exactly what they're supposed to and to secure a secure code and the infrastructure teams are 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 managing it well. Um, the security team has a role. We have to we have to um, observe security events and anomalies uh, so that we can sort of respond accordingly. So, generally speaking, those would be the three ways that an API um, uh, sort of ex exhibits risk. Sure, and I will 
eventually drill down on all three of mm -hmm. those. Um, can you, before we start talking about how you prevent or detect um, risks or or um, some type of um, you know security event, what can you give some real world examples of how um, you know APIs have been exploited? Sure. So the, uh, the, the sort of the low hanging fruit in terms of API problems that that um, you know that are that are fairly common in the world today would be uh, would be the circumstance where an, an API uh, lacks the uh, design or enforcement of authentication. So uh, authorization and authentication, those are the API top top risks one and two. So an, an example of that would be uh, like an API that was designed originally for two systems to talk internally on a network. Um, let's say it's let's say it's five years ago, and uh, you're a developer, and you have an API call going to another internal system. Um, at that time, probably you didn't employ like a strict authentication policy. Well, because it's just an internal network you know, hop, not particularly risky. Um, but at some point, uh, that API was then exposed publicly because it does something very useful, uh, and there was a, there was a desire to expose that service of data uh, to a third party or to a consumer channel. Um, and now that original API's design is, is wildly uh, sort of insecure for, for it to be consumed by the outside world. And so that's the type of thing that we sort of see oftentimes light up like a Christmas tree uh, in organizations is, is an API that was designed for one purpose and, and, and perhaps not particularly high risk, uh, and then it got used for something else. Okay, um, do you have any uh, high profile examples that we might've seen in the, in the news? Of an API breach. Oh, sure, sure. So I think, uh, um, well, it, there's there's a couple parts of API breaches. One is um, um, breaches where the API was faulty, uh, and then mm -hmm. there are breaches where API was simply the highway that the attacker used to exfiltrate data. And so, like a, a good example, um, like British Airways had a very sort of famous case litigated in Europe. Um, over the last couple of years, um, where the it was the web application itself uh, that was compromised, and the, and the adversary um, implanted an API into the web application to as a pathway to exfiltrate data. Now, that's a really fascinating case because in that case, the API was used because it's useful uh, to send data uh, outside of the network. But at no point did the did, British Airways didn't develop that API, uh, and they they didn't have a an awareness of the existence of it. And so that's a really interesting case for APIs because when we think about API security, um, it would be conventional wisdom and 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 let's go proper first step one is to is to look at source code and look at the design. And then we look at the configuration. We look at the network placement. We 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 model the API's behavior. Um, but that British Airways example is one that's really interesting because um, that's the, that was the attacker that wrote that code. And that was the attacker that used the API to exfiltrate data. Um, and then what that, what that puts us in is it puts us in a position um, of now having this other sort of API dynamic to solve for, which is uh, discovery of APIs um, universally uh, for intentional or unintentional APIs. And, and that's where we are today is we're, we're seeing um, attackers use APIs um, as an expo route. Um, and, and then broadly speaking, I think the, the more, um, at least to an American audience, uh, the, the, the consumer brands like Panera, Peloton, John Deere, uh, Facebook, Google, um, have all had fairly noteworthy API related um, security situations uh, from ranging from embarrassing, you know, embarrassing security researcher findings to actual um, like data outbound data leakage. Um, Carl, that that does some awesome information, and, and um, I think that maybe if you, you get tired of being a CISO, you could uh, go into marketing because I like that phrase, a security <laughs> situation. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, uh, we, yeah, we, we had a, we had a bit of a situation. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, that's the uh, that's the um um you know a, a, as a CISO, I'm I'm a little sensitive to the finger pointing game because right um le and, and uh, let's look at a couple of let's call it a couple of API situations even recently like uh, GitHub or Twilio for example. Um, there is there is uh, there's two sides of a coin when it comes to API utilization. There's the producer and the consumer of data. Uh, in, in in a lot of cases, I think what we find uh, it's that the it's that the consumer or the subscriber to the API uh, didn't follow the manual. Uh, and in that case, 
um, there's a bit of a finger pointing blame as terms of whether um, or sort of whose accountability is it. And your, so your I, API isn't safe. And it's like, well, actually, if you would have followed the instructions, yep. the best practices, it would have been a fine. Yeah. Right. So and, and so I, I mentioned a few companies, but I, I, I want to be clear that the um, uh, attribution of blame is kind of a different question. Uh, and in each sure. case, I think that there are cases to be made and, and litigated. And I mentioned the British Airways one because it's 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 pretty public and it's already sort of through the through the court system, it's, so to speak. Um, but there's a there's a there's a there's a two way handshake uh, that occurs mm -hmm. in um, API utilization and, and both parties in that handshake um, have a, a responsibility. Makes a lot of sense. Hey, um, so, you know, I'm familiar with like traditional network scans where, you know, you can tell uh, an organization, hey, you have these this many devices, you have this many users, these are inactive um, credentials, these are, these are uh, credentials that have anomalous activity, so on and so forth. I have never actually seen one that does that tells you how many APIs that you have. Um, but I but I heard you say that um, you know one of the things that you need to do is kind of create this awareness. Is that is that something that No Name does? Is you do you kind of do a discovery in terms of hey, this is how many APIs that you have open on your platform? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, with APIs though, um, there's a there's a um, th there's only a half story though. Um, if you go through the discovery process, like you might would for, let's say, a Vuln scanner, Tenable, Qualys, mm -hmm. for example, uh, you know, let's just take those Vuln scanners. They they tell you whether your operating system is has a vulnerability, and it's you know, sort of true. That's that's not, you know, ob it's objectively fact based. Um, but that's a single point of observation. In APIs, that doesn't work, and the the reason it doesn't work is one has to look at the API endpoint itself uh, and, and characterize it in terms of how it's designed and what it talks to. Um, but the second piece is we have to also observe the traffic and how traffic comes and goes from that API. So we have to go upstream as well to see where it's placed on the network, um, uh, how, how it is authenticated through a gateway or how it's protected by other layers. So, uh, so let me go back to the, the the first you know the first thing we talked about is like what goes wrong with an API well it could be bad code um, or it could be configuration and so um, we need to see both of those to see whether your API is at risk so we need to see the API through basic scanning and observation but we also need to sort of uh, derive what its network pathways are uh, that it, that it, that it traffic data through because unless we can also diagnose those network pathways we're only getting half the story so we have to triangulate those two things together and that tells us whether our api is vulnerable and i'm assuming you 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 have an output of something that says hey um you know we've we've scanned your api uh posture or you know and and we've matched it up against known vulnerabilities we have the top 10 and then you said you look at kind of maybe 150 actually um is, is that what you're doing is you're just matching it up against these known vulnerabilities um or you know explain a little bit um, in more detail how it actually is going to what's the output going to be sure so what we um um so matching up against vulnerabilities is actually um, doesn't really apply in APIs. So like here, so here's an example. Um, my okay, API I, you, you, you mentioned risks. You mentioned yep. risks earlier. Top ten yep. risks. Okay, so I'm, I, I sometimes I use that interchangeably, yep. which is not correct. But go ahead. Yeah. So so the the, the difference is is like let's because we're you know most of us are familiar with like a vulnerability scan in an operating system. Um, and uh, what but for APIs, what we have to do is we have to we have to observe the API behaving in order to understand what risk exposure it has. So that includes uh, looking at the traffic going to and from the API as, a, as the mechanism to sort of have the insight into what vulnerabilities are present or not present. Because the, um, uh, the, the reality is, is every API is a, is a unique piece of source code. Uh, and so, uh, for example, I can't share my vulnerabilities with you or my, my I, we can't necessarily share each other's um, API risks because your code is different than my code. So the way that we diagnose the vulnerabilities um, is by observing the traffic and the behavior of the API. Um, so it's 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 observation with via traffic ra versus rather than observation of just sort of like a, a, like a, a I call it a, a like scan a root scan. Yeah. Okay. And and so t walk 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 us through how that would work in terms of you know how heavy is the deployment? How long does it take? How long do you need to run it? 
Sure. So, so the uh, back to this uh, sort of basic concept of traffic. The, the 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 traffic tells us everything there is to know about APIs. Um, so, what we do is is is, uh, is listen. We listen to network flows. Uh, depending on the network, that that network flow information can come from everything from an AWS you know IAM account that's a you know read only network account or a transit gateway or a network node or a load balancer wherever traffic is is um uh, b being funneled in a, in a in a in a network that's where we listen and so that that listen is is one way it's passive so that the deployment of listener in the in the case of public cloud takes a matter of minutes and then what and then it becomes a function of 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 listening to enough traffic to establish a sort of statistically viable sample size to to diagnose and understand vulnerabilities that can be as fast as a few hours or in the case of a of, of some apis that only are invoked you know daily or or periodically um it, it, may, it may take a week or two to sort of establish a, a baseline of of activity and behavior it, when you're out talking with uh, uh with prospective customers what are their major concerns what are the the, the top three questions or concerns that you're hearing um, most customers' concerns come in two flavors. Um, the first is uh, the 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 discussion with the security team is the security team is un is um, their confidence level that they know all of the APIs that are deployed in their organization and just want to know where everything is at. Let's call it the housekeeping question. Uh, there are very few security teams that have a high level of confidence that they know exactly what APIs are in use. Um, knowing what's in use is the precursor question to whether that's whether what it is in use is vulnerable. But you have to have that the sort of first answer of of I don't know what I don't know. Um, uh, that's that's a that's a really tricky question for security teams to solve for. So um, that's that's probably the majority of the um, starting point is getting that observability. So at least we can see what the universe of landscape of APIs looks like. Um, the second. Uh, not quite as frequently, but becoming more so very, very quickly, uh, is the security team whose pressing concern is keeping up with the speed of developers with developing new APIs. And so uh, those are security teams that may be seen as a bottleneck uh, to or a, or a, uh, a barrier to uh, speed of delivery of new software. And so those are security teams that we're talking about. How do we um, integrate with code repositories and CACD pipelines with automation that can perform like rigorous security testing on APIs during the development phase uh, that don't require like lengthy manual reviews uh, or in a lot of cases just avoiding avoiding the like expensive third party pen testing. So uh, depending on the, the first discussion, uh, I'd say probably those are the two Mm, uh, pressing concerns for security teams, and it really is becoming more so the case, especially in the last six months, where that that very first um, call is a discussion about the security team's um, speed of execution, particularly yeah. when it's the security team that's the bad guy holding up the new revenue generating app. I see that all the time. It's the the classic battle between security and production, or even compliance and business. Um, yep. Yeah, I mean, you have that 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 same kind of tension there. Um, when 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 you are you know offering your solution though um what questions do they do you face specifically related to no names um services like are there any concerns about hey if we let you in here um it, how do you know what what are what are what are people concerned about in terms of you know bringing you in is it just cost or is it like uh, some other you know are you going to expose something that they don't want exposed or mm -hmm. is it you know what are what are the concerns yeah, there's really you know, the concerns come down to two things. Number one is the sensitivity of the data. So let's say that that's a financial institution or a regulated industry or or it's a healthcare industry. Um, if if we're going to see into the APIs, we're going to be seeing all the customers' data. So well, first first um, hurdle for us to to um, jump is um, where to place the listener and and where to keep the data. So for example, we offer options that are a fully on-prem. Uh, run it in your data center, 
no outside connectivity option all the way to running it as kind of like a full SaaS offering. There's hybrid in between. Um, but we first want to establish with that, that customer, um, what, is their, what is their policy and risk tolerance for where this data, because we're going to inspect the data, um, wh where does it need to be stored? Um, so we can, we can flex in that regard. So usually there's, um, we can get over that hurdle pretty quickly. Um, and then the second hurdle is uh, the, the, the scars that a security team feels historically about, about stopping production systems accidentally. Um, you know, I, I've countless times, uh, unfortunately, and where, you know, days where uh, a, ma a malware agent uh, accidentally identifies uh, an application as malicious and shuts it down, right? That's, that's the security team's, you know, worst nightmare is that we just stopped business from operating for no good reason. Um, so we have to have that discussion about where to place the listener and, and how we do that in a read only, we'll call it an out of band mode, because security teams are, are, um, are uh, reluctant to put in technology that has a, a likelihood for operational outage. And that's super important for us to, to get to that architectural design uh, that is, um, uh, is, is sort of scalable, but presents virtually not no risk, but you know the the minimalist risk possible to disrupting production operations makes it makes a lot of sense. yeah, and you I'm sure you've just put a lot of people's minds at ease because <laughs> you know it's it whenever you bring in an outsider and say, hey, you know, what one is like there's there's you know sometimes there's a reluctance of we we don't really want to be told what we don't you know but, yep. but how are we gonna how are we actually gonna find out how many APIs or how many you know what our network looks like unless we bring in somebody that can you know a subject matter expert that can do it um, and then the other two concerns that you mentioned are are, are very real um, let me ask you I mean because you know you're you're CISO for a security organization so. In your role, are you primarily focused on no name security as a entity and protecting you know your organization? Are you primarily focused on your product uh, and and making sure that it works appropriately? or are you kind of in a hybrid road mode and also interacting with customers? I get a sense that you probably interact with some customers to understand what they're mm -hmm. looking for as well, but you tell me you tell me. Uh, absolutely. So prior prior to coming to No Name, I, I was a customer of No Name. So okay. um, that was uh, uh, the, the transition that I made, having a, a a pretty good familiarity with the platform and and the team. Um, so when I, I came to No Name, uh, and and I'd say seventy to eighty percent of my focus is in the protection of No Name. So it's the it's the estate, um, right. uh, which is the, the 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 hardening of our platforms, the um, you know security operations, monitoring, access control. Um, and then risk and compliance of the platform. So 80% of my job looks looks exactly like my CISO roles in past organizations um, uh, have. The the other 20%, which is really the the customer facing piece, um, is uh, for example, we have an advisory board of mm -hmm. of e external industry experts, uh, customers um, who provide that um, input into product roadmap and and uh, as well as just like I call it being at conferences, going to understand like what the um, uh, the sensibilities are about the category of API security or our product specifically. So I can bring that back to the product team uh, and, and, and help them digest that as part of, um, you know, feature requests and product roadmaps and, 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 you know, release updates as part of the product itself. Excellent. And, and those are kind of different skill sets. They're related, but different. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you this. And in, in your traditional CISO role, where you're protecting the estate of no name, what what top one, two, three pieces of advice would you give to other CISOs? Um, I think advice number one would be um, the, the 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 most the more direct linear relationship that a security team can make to the business's revenue streams in mm -hmm. terms of like for example for us we're as a security vendor so um there's a very short case to make for things like why we need to encrypt data at rest and in transit or why we need to um, integrate applications into single sign-on put in MFA um, because for us the the reality of the um, the business value of of that is very present for us every day. Um, we don't. I don't need to create a um, a leap of faith uh, in the security team to for the security 
uh, to be a priority. Um, but I, th but when I go back in my career to banking and finance and and retail, um, there's always a case to make for security having a direct benefit to like business revenue generating activities. Um, in banking, a lot of the times I was um, um, a part of, or if not leading, customer relationship development because in banking, uh, what 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 is what is banking? Um, how do you how do you differentiate between banks um, different than the interest rates that you receive or pay and the level of trust you have with your bank? And so that trust part of the equation was how uh, I positioned uh, our team as a part of the trust value proposition for the bank. Um, I think every business has that uh, connective tissue that they can make to the like the lines of business. Um, mm -hmm. And so mission one is is seek that out and and really emphasize it um dedicate the time to it and and take credit for it um be a part of the <laughs> business's bu business value delivery um, yeah i mean if at, you're if you're yep. if, if your sales people are out there um talking about you know these great security features that you have as a differentiating factor in the marketplace that's huge um, and you've you've done your job, and now you're a partner with them, as opposed to what you talked about earlier, a bottleneck. You know, and that can be yep. um, not just with development; it can be with business as well. But but go ahead, please. Um, and and the, I mean, the other part is um, is uh, is I, regardless of the size of the organization, um, m m even companies with seemingly unlimited budgets at the top of the the banking spectrum, uh, they need partners. You, you need third party integrators. You need service providers. And you need public sector partners like FBI or FSISAC or Health Care ISAC. Those, uh, um, this is this is not a um, uh, a game we can play in a, in a silo. And so I'd say that the the, the stronger partnerships that are sitting to our, our right and left uh, in, in industry uh, and in the public sector, um, those are really force multipliers uh, when we can tap into those strengths of of partners, whether it's a you know, a service provider per performing an overnight service, or whether it's a, a a specialty shop that has a technical capability, or or if it's just a, um, you know, I, I, the the CISO networks sometimes are just a phone a friend because I need some advice on something that's really challenging. Uh, so I think that the 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 more leaning we do into our our partners, um, uh, we can really benefit um, in, sort of in absence of unlimited budget. I think that's some some great advice as well. And, and oftentimes it doesn't matter what kind of business you're in. People <clears throat> try to sometimes go it alone too much. Um, and yep. in in this networked uh, information collaborative world that we're living in, you got to leverage that. You got to leverage those those trusted relationships. That's that's awesome. Hey, um, you you brought up the FBI uh, in terms of partnering and and in leveraging their their capabilities. I did notice on your LinkedIn profile though that you are a graduate of the FBI CISO Academy. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, sure. So uh, I had did I did serve in the military uh, for eight years, um, and as a contractor. So for a decade, for my first professional decade, I, I was in the national security field. Um, and then when I moved over to the private sector, um, I, I very much still wanted to be uh, a contributor to 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 the mission. Um, you know, the national security was never something that fell off my radar. So uh, engagements like uh, uh, being a part of FBI's InfraGuard program, um, I had the opportunity to to be a, a, a sector co-chair in Los Angeles, uh, a member of the, the chapter here in Minnesota, uh, and uh, given the opportunity to go to the FBI Academy and spend a week with uh, FBI leadership, as well as like CISO peers from across the country, um, I, I gained a great deal from that, just getting the perspective of what's happening at the national level, um, but then always having the connective tissue to the public sector because uh, it, it isn't it isn't frequent that um, uh, a CISO needs to be on the phone with the local FBI field office, um, but if when you find yourself in that situation, uh, it makes a world <laughs> of difference if if yeah. they if you know each other, uh, you know each right. other as credible, trusted, you know. Um, players. Uh, so if I'm going to report uh, uh, an incident to the FBI, uh, I, I'm a known quantity, my company is a known quantity, and there's a pathway of trust there. That's amazing. And I, yeah, again, it goes back to that, the power of your network. I took a course through uh, Harvard Extension. It was uh, managing risk in the information age or, uh, and kind of my network just exploded from that. And it's it's so cool that I, you know, because I, 
people say, oh, well, you've been doing this podcast and, you know, you've been working in cybersecurity for X number of years. And so, you know, cybersecurity, I'm like, oh my God, there's so many different rabbit holes that you can go down and there's no, it's impossible for any one person to know them all. And whenever I need to get some additional information about something, I can just reach out to my network and people, people love to share typically. So very cool. Hey, um, last question, actually totally jumping tracks here. Is there anything on the consumer side as individuals? Because at the end of the day, I mean, we all work for organizations, but we're all, we also have our homes and our families, anything like that. Anything that we should be aware of or concerned about in terms of APIs? That's a, that's a great question. Um, uh, I mean, I think that the, the, the API is not typically uh, going to be the end user facing sort of risk proposition. Um, I, I think that the I, I would prefer to take the take the end user, take the consumer off the hook, uh, because if we focus our API security efforts on the the largest enterprises and corporations that produce the services we all rely on, um, really at a, right. at a at a global level, um, I think we have a dramatic increase or we have a dramatic improvement in in instances of data theft, instances of 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 cyber fraud, and so to some degree, I, I I would probably ask the user and the consumer to s stay focused on the basics, like patching your system and not clicking a link in email and turning on MFA. Because <laughs> um, if, if we ask yeah. the user to do a list of 25 things, I don't think that's going to work well. I, I think that we can we can keep the consumer focused on a couple of things, and and those of us that are enterprise, like we need to take the ball and run with with the parts of this equation that we can solve for. I totally agree with you. And um, you, you did just say um, you, you focus on the basics and you said uh, patching patching vulnerabilities. I think that's what you said. Um, yep. Explain to any of the consumers that are out there listening what what, what exactly that means. Um, that means uh, for your whatever computer you use in your smartphone, um, have that device set to automatically install updates or yeah, if, if that setting is not available, um, um, most computers and iPhones will tell you uh, there's an update pending. Uh, just install it. Uh, it's 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 the kind of the 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 um, the reality of the world we live in that um, even the most sophisticated companies in the world, uh, their software does need to be updated because criminals find a way. Uh, so as a as a practice, you know whether it's once a month to go to the iPhone and just update all the apps, or whether it's to go on your computer and just you know. Is my computer updated? You know, update now on on Windows. Um, it's a it's a dramatic difference it makes in um, the susceptibility of the user to the device being compromised. And when the device is compromised, then your data is compromised. Yeah, and it's funny because um, one, not all day updates are security related. Um, some of them are just, you know, enhancements to the the OS or the operating system or the platform, the tools, etc. You know, whatever apps you're using. Um, but oftentimes they are security related, so you do need that. But it's not just, uh, you know, devices. If, you know, if you if you drive in a, a Tesla, for example, you're getting uh, over the air uh, updates uh, automatically, real time, and some of those are security related. And um, and, and I, I don't even know if Tesla owners have an opportunity to block them. I would assume that Tesla would insist because that's some some pretty critical, you know, update information that's going out in terms of you know the your, your braking systems and 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 other things to do with the safety of the vehicle. But um, but it, yeah, it's imp it's very very much important. Right now, the the economy is kind of in this strange <laughs> situation um, where we're experiencing inflation, but some budgets are getting cut. Um, you know, there's supply chain issues. How is that affecting, or what are, what are you seeing? I, I think the, uh, the 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 trend, if 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 technology but budgets are going to be um, reduced. Uh, is actually one that that veers straight into APIs as even more central to technology. So, like for example, let's say a, a company has um, a whole series of application projects during the course of the next year, uh, and they and they decide to cut those projects. They can instead, um, uh, instead of building their own systems, they might be able to to utilize API-based third-party services as a as a cheaper, more economical, faster way uh, to deliver service than perhaps a, a like a traditional application development project. So uh, what that really presents the security team with is a, is a reality where um, API utilization is already increasing as it was. Um, we might put the gas pedal down and APIs being the sort of the central, you know, the sort of the central focus of security because uh, that's the API based economy uh, is it, it sort of represents a fast, efficient, interoperable, 
um, cheaper systems. And, and that, that does present um, an increase in risk of APIs uh, despite um, sort of less, less development of, of the traditional sense. Well, in earlier we discussed that you know the average enterprise with over ten thousand employees mm -hmm. has something like fifteen thousand plus APIs in use. Do you see that number then rapidly increasing? Um, yes, because it would be um, uh, let's say the let's say that it's it's a we're talking about a bank for example, and that bank wants to provide a new service that uh, gives its customers the current value of their of their home. Um, the bank can develop an application themselves that that calculates the value of your home for you. Uh, it's cheaper, faster, easier uh, to the instead of developing your own application, just uh, engage with a third party that offers that data as a service. And then you can give that that data to your customer in their mobile app um, at very low cost, very inefficient. But what you've done is you've added APIs now to your environment. And so that's a that's an example of why the explosive growth of APIs um, uh, really does not recede. It probably increases under um, cost pressures. Yeah, and I'm just thinking with the explosion of IoT devices, the explosion of the number of apps, the amount of data being collected, it's it doesn't look like linear growth for APIs. It probably looks more exponential. Um, it's just you know, so uh, so I think you're in a good space. Um, that said, uh, you know, with that growth comes, you know, a proportional increase in risk. Yeah, and that's and that's why the the, the word that I like to use uh, is to develop a competency. Um, uh, security teams need to develop a competency and APIs uh, for securing them, because the the API problem set is not the problem set only of today. It's the problem set we're going to have in the future. So whether it's uh, no name or a different technology or processes and policies, security teams have to grapple, I think really grapple with this. This is a, this needs to be a core competency, then that core competency is gonna, gonna um, survive you know, a decade or longer. Makes a lot of sense. Well, hey, um, Carl, I really enjoyed this conversation and I, I, I get the feeling that we could talk a lot more about APIs um, and, and go down a much deeper rabbit hole. Um, let, let me just, uh, you know, parting words, if people wanted to find out more about APIs, please tell us how they can reach out to you or your organization, but also share some advice in terms of what industry events or publications or associations that they should be looking at. Uh, well, so Mark, you, uh, you you flattered me at the beginning of the of the of the session. You mentioned the CISSP certification. So um, what I would recommend, uh, nonamesecurity.com is our website, and of course we can do demos and and you know free POCs. Uh, but for anybody interested in just learning more about API security, we do what's called a workshop. It's a it's a four hour API security workshop. Uh, it it is a, we have a partnership with ISC squared, which is the uh, certification authority for CISSP. Sure. So if anybody takes the workshop, uh, not only do you get a free no name t-shirt, uh, but you also get four <laughs> uh, CPE credits for your certifications. Um, and it, it's 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 really the uh, API security from A to Z in a, in a four hour training session. Um, it, it talk, we talk a lot about uh, how threat actors compromise APIs. How do we as defenders protect them? Um, what are the what are the tools of the trade and how do we understand this chessboard of API security? So uh, I really think that's a fantastic place for people to, to start um, with very little familiarity at all with API security in four hours, you can walk away feeling uh, pretty much like you kind of understand the geometry, um, not uh, at an expert level, but certainly proficient in, in the, the mechanics of it. And that's something that uh, we we love to do. Awesome. And, and that inf information is available on your website as well. Yep. Yep. Nonamesecurity.com slash workshop. Awesome. Well, I'll put a link to that in the show notes. Hey, Carl, really enjoyed this conversation. And thank you so much for uh, for taking time to, uh, to be on Secure Talk. My pleasure. Thank you, Mark. Hello, welcome to Secure Talk, your trusted source of information on the latest threats, trends, tools, and technology related to cybersecurity and compliance.